Chapter 21, Part 1 of Social Statics by Herbert Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Bosk. Social Statics, or the Conditions Essential to Human Happiness Specified, and the First of Them Developed, by Herbert Spencer. Chapter 21, The Duty of the State, Part 1. Section 1. As already said, Morality stands towards government only in the nature of a limitation, behaves negatively with regard to it, not positively, replies to all inquiries by silently indicating the conditions of existence, constitution, and conduct, under which alone it may be ethically tolerated. And thus, ignoring government altogether, the moral law can give us no direct information as to what a government ought to do can merely say what it ought not to do. That we are left with no precise knowledge beyond this may indeed be inferred from a preceding chapter. For if, as was shown, every man has a right to secede from the state, and if, as a consequence, the state must be regarded as a body of men voluntarily associated, there remains nothing to distinguish it in the abstract from any other incorporated society nothing to determine its specific function, and we may conceive its members assigning to it any function that does not involve a breach of the moral law, immediate guidance in this matter being thus impossible, we must follow such indirect ways of arriving at the truth as are open to us. The question is no longer one of pure ethics, and is therefore incapable of solution by any exact methods approximative ones only are available. Fortunately, there are several of these, and converging as they do to the same conclusion, that conclusion assumes something like the character of certainty. Let us now successively employ them. Section 2. Good and perfect and complete are words applicable to whatever is thoroughly fitted to its purpose, and by the word moral, we signify the same property in a man. A thing which entirely answers its end cannot be improved, and a man whose nature leads him to a spontaneous fulfillment of the divine will cannot be conceived better. To be quite self-sufficing, to have powers exactly commensurate with what ought to be done, is to be organically moral. Given the ordained object, happiness, given the conditions under which this happiness is to be compassed, and perfection consists in the possession of faculties exactly adapted to these conditions. Whilst the moral law is simply a statement of that line of conduct by which the conditions are satisfied. Hence, to the rightly constituted man, all external help is needless, detrimental even, just as the healthy body wants no crutch, tonic, or stimulus, but has within itself the means of doing everything required of it, so the normally developed character asks no artificial aids, and indeed repudiates them as preoccupying the sphere for the exercise of faculties which the hypothesis supposes it to have. When, on the other hand, man's constitution and the conditions of his existence are not in harmony, there arise external agencies to supply the place of deficient internal faculties, and these temporary substitutes being supplementary to the faculties, and assisting the imperfect man as they do to fulfill the law of his being, the moral law, as we call it, obtain a certain reflex authority from that law, varying with the degree in which they subserve its requirements. Whatever may be its special function, it is clear that government is one of these artificial aids, and the most important of them. Or the case may perhaps be more clearly stated thus, if government has any duty at all, that duty must be to perform a service of some kind, to confer a benefit. But every possible benefit or service which can be rendered to a man is comprehended under the general expression of assisting him to fulfill the law of his being. Whether you feed the hungry, or cure the diseased, or defend the weak, or curb the vicious, you do but enable or constrain them to conform to the conditions of complete happiness more nearly than they would otherwise do so, and causing conformity to the conditions of complete happiness is causing conformity to the moral law. 
If, therefore, all benefits that can be conferred on men are aids to the fulfillment of the moral law, the benefits to be conferred by government must be of this nature. So much being conceded, let us next inquire how the moral law may be most essentially subserved. Practicability manifestly underlies performance. That which makes an act feasible must take precedence of the act itself. Before the injunction, do this, there necessarily comes the postulate, it can be done. Before establishing a code for the right exercise of faculties, there must be established the condition which makes the exercise of faculties possible. Now, this condition which makes the exercise of faculties possible is power to pursue the objects on which they are to be exercised, the objects of desire, and this is what we otherwise call liberty of action, freedom. But that which makes the exercise of faculties possible is that which makes the fulfillment of the moral law possible. And freedom being thus grand prerequisite to the fulfillment of the moral law, it follows that if a man is to be helped in fulfilling the moral law, the first thing to be done is to secure to him this all-essential freedom. This aid must come before any other aid, is in fact that which renders any other aid practicable for no faculty to which liberty of action is denied can be assisted in the performance of its function until liberty of action has been restored. Of all institutions, therefore, which the imperfect man sets up as supplementary to his nature, the chief one must have for its office to guarantee his freedom. But the freedom that can be guaranteed to each is bounded by the like freedom to be guaranteed to all others. This is necessitated both by the moral law and by the simultaneous claims made upon the institution itself by its clients. Hence, we must infer that it is the function of this chief institution, which we call a government, to uphold the law of equal freedom. To determine the duty of the state by reverting to a supposed understanding entered into by the founders of society, a social contract, we have already seen to be impracticable. Men did not deliberately establish political arrangements, but grew into them unconsciously, probably had no conception of an associated condition until they found themselves in it. Moreover, were the hypothesis of an original agreement reasonable, it could not help us, for it would be folly to assume that the duties imposed by a horde of savages on their chief, or council of chiefs, must necessarily be the duties of governments throughout all time. Nevertheless, if, instead of speculating as to what might have happened during the infancy of civilization, we consider what must have happened, something may be learnt. On turning to page 203, the reader will find it argued at length that for men to have remained in the associated state implies that on the whole they found it preferable to the isolated one which means that they obtained a greater sum total of gratification under it, which means that it afforded them fuller exercise for their faculties, which means that it offered a safer guarantee for such exercise, more security for their claims to life and property, that is, for their rights. But if men could have continued in the associated state only because on the average it ensured their rights better than the previous one, then the insurance of their rights becomes the special duty which society in its corporate capacity has to perform towards individuals. That function by which a thing begins to exist we may safely consider its all-essential function. Now, whilst those many aids to gratification which civilization has brought us were yet undeveloped, Society must have existed only because it protected its members in the pursuit of those things which afford satisfaction to the faculties. But to protect men in the pursuit of those things which afford satisfaction to the faculties is to maintain their rights. And if it was by maintaining the rights of its members that society began to be, then to maintain their rights must ever be regarded as its primary duty. Further confirmation may be drawn from the universal practice of mankind in this matter. Widely, as people have differed respecting the proper bounds of legislative superintendence, all have held them to include the defense of the subject against aggression. Whilst, in various countries and times, a hundred different functions have been assigned to the state, 
whilst there have probably been no two governments that have entirely agreed in the number and nature of their functions, whilst the things specially attended to by some have been wholly neglected by others, and thereby proved non-essential, there is one office, that of protector, which has been common to them all. Did this fact stand alone, it might by a stretch of incredulity be construed into an accident, but coinciding as it does with the foregoing inferences drawn from the nature of man's constitution and the necessary origin of society, we may safely take it as a further evidence that the duty of the state is to protect, to enforce the law of equal freedom, to maintain men's rights, or as we commonly express it, to administer justice. Section 3. The question, what is the thing to be done by a government, being answered, there arises the other, which is the most efficient mode of doing it. To the proposition, the administration of justice is the special duty of the state, there hangs the corollary, the state ought to employ the best methods of fulfilling that duty, and this brings us to the inquiry, what are they? By our hypothesis, the connection of each individual with the community as politically organized must be voluntary. In virtue of its very office, an institution which proposes to guarantee a man's freedom to exercise his faculties can only tender its services to him, cannot coerce him into the acceptance of them. If it does, it becomes self-contradicting, violates that very freedom which it proposes to maintain. Citizenship then being willingly assumed, we must inquire what agreement is thereby tacitly answered into between the state and its members. Two things are conceivable. There may either be an understanding that whoever applies to the judicial power for assistance shall defray the costs thereupon incurred by it on his behalf, or it may be provided that the payment of a constant contribution towards the expenses of this judicial power shall entitle the contributor to its services whenever he needs them. The first of these arrangements does not seem altogether practicable. The other is one to which existing systems partially assimilate. In either case, however, it is taken for granted that the parties will duly fulfill their promises, that equivalents of protection and taxation shall be exchanged, that on the one side, if the individual chooses to avail himself of state guardianship, he shall not refuse his fair share of state burdens, and on the other, that when the state has imposed the burdens, it shall not withhold the guardianship. Self-evident as this interpretation of the agreement, which citizenship presupposes, judicial practice is but little guided by it. Our system of jurisprudence takes a very one-sided view of the matter. It is indeed stringent enough in enforcing the claim of the state against the subject, but as to the reciprocal claim of the subject against the state, it is comparatively careless. That it recognizes the title of the taxpayer to protection is true, but it is also true that it does this but partially. From certain infringements of rights, arbitrarily classed as criminal, it is ready to defend every complainant but against others not so classed, it leaves everyone to defend himself. The most trifling injury, if inflicted in a specified manner, is cognizable by the magistrate, and redress may be obtained free of charge. But if otherwise inflicted, the injury, no matter how serious, must be passively borne, unless the sufferer has plenty of money and a sufficiency of daring. Let a man have a hat knocked over his eyes, and the law will zealously espouse his cause, will mulk his assailant in a fine and costs, and will do this without charge. But if, instead of having been bonneted, he has been wrongfully imprisoned, he is politely referred to a solicitor, with the information that the offense committed against him is actionable, which means that if rich he may play double or quits with fate, and that if poor he must go without even this chance of compensation. Against picking of pockets, as ordinarily practiced, the ruling power grants its lieges gratuitous protection, but pockets may be picked in various indirect ways, and it will idly look on unless costly means are taken to interest it. It will rush to the defense of one who has been deprived of a few turnips by a half-starved tramp. But as to the estate on which these turnips grew, 
that may be stolen without risk so long as the despoiled owner is left friendless and penniless footnote it is true that a plaintiff who can swear that he is not worth five pounds may sue in ferma pauperis but this privilege is almost a dead letter actions so instituted are usually found to fail because those who conduct them having to plead gratuitously plead carelessly end of footnote some complaints need only to be whispered and it forthwith plays the parts of constable lawyer judge and jailer whilst to others it turns a deaf ear unless they are made through its bribed hangers-on now it is the injured man's champion and now it throws down its weapons to sit as umpire whilst oppressor and oppressed run and tilt at each other over such and such portions of a citizen's rights it mounts guard and cries who goes there to every intruder but upon the rest any one may trample without fear of being challenged by it to a man with perceptions unblunted by custom this mode of carrying out the agreement subsisting between himself and the state would seem strange enough it is not impossible that he might call the transaction a swindle might argue that his property had been taken from him under false pretenses to what purpose he might ask did i submit myself to your laws if i am now to be denied the advantages promised in return have i not complied with all the stipulations you demanded allegiance and i gave it you said money was needful and i paid the uttermost farthing of your exactions heavy as they were you required me to fulfill certain civil functions and i fulfilled them cheerfully yet now when i ask you to give me that for which i made these sacrifices you shuffle i suppose you were to act the part of the argus-eyed and briarous armed guardian ever watching over my interests ever ready to step in and defend them so that whether sleeping or waking absorbed in business or immersed in pleasure i might have the gratifying consciousness of being carefully shielded from injury now however i find not only that my rights may be trespassed upon in many ways without attracting your notice but that even when i tell you i have been wronged and demand your interposition you shut the door in my face and will not listen until i have exorbitantly feed some of the servants who have access to your private ear what am i to understand by this is it that your revenue is insufficient to defray the cost of dispensing justice in all cases if so why not say as much and let us increase it is it that you cannot accomplish what you profess if so declare candidly what you are able to do and what not but at any rate let us have some intelligible understanding and not this jumble of contradictions this conflict of promise and performance this taking of the pay without doing the duty section four that men should sit down so apathetically as they do under the present corrupt administration of justice is not a little remarkable that we with all our jealousy of abuses with all our opportunities of canvassing blaming and amending the acts of the legislature with all our readiness to organize and agitate with the anti-corn law slavery abolition and catholic emancipation victories fresh in remembrance that we the independent determined self-ruling english should daily behold the giant abominations of our judicial system and yet do nothing to rectify them is really quite incomprehensible it is not as though the facts were disputed all men are agreed upon them the dangers of law are proverbial the names of its officers are used as synonyms for trickery and greediness the decisions of its courts are typical of chance in all companies you hear but one opinion and each person confirms it by a fresh illustration now you are informed of three hundred pounds having been expended in the recovery of forty shillings worth of property and again of a cause that was lost because an affirmation could not be received in place of an oath a right-hand neighbor can tell you of a judge who allowed an indictment to be objected to on the plea that the words in the year of our lord were not inserted before the date and another to your left narrates how a thief lately tried for stealing a guinea pig was acquitted because a guinea pig was shown to be a kind of rat and a rat could not be property 
at one moment the story is of a poor man whose rich enemy has deliberately ruined him by tempting him into litigation and at the next it is of a child who has been kept in prison for six weeks in default of sureties for her appearance as witness against one who had assaulted her footnote the case occurred at winchester in july eighteen forty nine end of footnote this gentleman has been cheated out of half his property but dared not attempt to recover it for fear of losing more whilst his less prudent companion can parallel the experience of him who said that he had only twice been on the verge of ruin once when he had lost a lawsuit and once when he had gained one on all sides you are told of trickery and oppression and revenge committed in the name of justice of wrongs endured for want of money wherewith to purchase redress of rights unclaimed because contention with the powerful usurper was useless of chancery suits that outlasted the lives of the suitors of fortunes swallowed up in settling a title of estates lost by an informality and then comes a catalogue of victims of those who have trusted and been deceived gray-headed men whose hardly earned savings went to fatten the attorney threadbare and hollow-cheeked insolvents who lost all in the attempt to get their due some who had been reduced to subsist on the charity of friends others who had died the death of a pauper with not a few whose anxieties had produced insanity or who in their desperation had committed suicide yet whilst all parties echo each other's exclamations of disgust these iniquities continue unchecked section five there are not wanting however men who defend this state of things who actually argue that government should perform but imperfectly what they allow to be its special function whilst on the one hand they admit that administration of justice is the vital necessity of civilized life they maintain on the other that justice may be administered too well for say they were law cheap all men would avail themselves of it did there exist no difficulty in obtaining justice justice would be demanded in every case of violated rights ten times as many appeals would be made to the authorities as now men would rush into legal proceedings on the slightest provocation and litigation would be so enormously increased as to make the remedy worse than the disease such is the argument an argument involving either a gross absurdity or an unwarrantable assumption for observe when this great multiplication of law proceedings under a gratuitous administration of justice is urged as a reason why things should remain as they are it is implied that the evils attendant upon the rectification of all wrongs would be greater than are the evils attendant upon submission to those wrongs either the great majority of civil aggressions must be borne in silence as now or must be adjudicated upon as then and the allegation is that the first alternative is preferable but if ten thousand litigations are worse than ten thousand injustices then one litigation is worse than one injustice which means that as a general principle an appeal to the law for protection is a greater evil than the trespass complained of which means that it would be better to have no administration of justice at all if for the sake of escaping this absurdity it be assumed that as things are now all great wrongs are rectified that the costliness of law prevents insignificant ones only from being brought to the court and that consequently the above inference cannot be drawn then either denial is given to the obvious fact that by the poverty they inflict many of the greatest wrongs incapacitate their victims from obtaining redress and to the obvious fact that the civil injuries suffered by the masses though absolutely small are relatively great or else it is taken for granted that on nine-tenths of the population who are too poor to institute legal proceedings no civil injuries of moment are ever inflicted nor is this all it is not necessarily true that making the law easy of access would increase litigation an opposite effect might be produced the prophecy is vitiated by that very common mistake of calculating the result of some new arrangement on the assumption that all other things would remain as they are it is taken for granted that under the hypothetical regime just as many transgressions would occur as at present 
whereas any candid observer can see that most of the civil offenses now committed are committed in consequence of the inefficiency of our judicial system for sparing justice feeds iniquity it is the difficulty that he knows there will be in convicting him which tempts the knave to behave knavishly were not the law so expensive and so uncertain dishonest traders would never risk the many violations of it they now do the trespasses of the wealthy against the poor would be rare were it not that the aggrieved have practically no remedy mark how to the man who contemplates wronging his fellow our legal system holds out promises of impunity should his proposed victim be one of small means there is the likelihood that he will not be able to carry on a lawsuit here is encouragement should he possess enough money why even then having like most people a great dread of litigation he will probably bear his loss unresistingly here is further encouragement lastly our plotter remembers that should his victim venture in action judicial decisions are very much matters of accident and that the guilty are often rescued by clever counsel here is still more encouragement and so all things considered he determines to chance it now he would never decide thus were legal protection efficient were the administration of law prompt gratuitous and certain those probabilities and possibilities which now beckon him on to fraudulent acts would vanish civil injuries wittingly committed would almost cease only in cases where both parties sincerely believe themselves right would judicial arbitration be called for and the number of such cases is comparatively small litigation therefore so far from increasing on justice being made easy of obtainment would probably decrease end of chapter 21 part 1